Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tim Robson. I'm the Deputy Director of the Calvin Smith Library, and uh, we want to welcome you to the first of the 2009 and 2010 Scholarly Communication Lecture Series uh, here at Calvin Smith Library. Uh, some of you might be a little bit curious. This series is really an extension of a series that we've been doing for a number of years that we call the Digital Library Lecture Series. And this year we have rebranded it as uh, Scholarly Communications because it uh, more closely uh, is more closely accurate to the kinds of things that we're uh, doing around here. Uh, just sort of as a recap of some of the folks that we've had on, on this lecture series in the past, we've, uh, we've had David Germano from uh, University of Virginia, Dan Cohen, Kathleen Woodward, uh, Siva Vaidanathan, so sort of the, the, the cream of the crop of, of people who are interested in uh, scholarly communications going on. Uh, our next uh, lecture will be on Friday, April 9th of 2010 at 12.30 in this space again, uh, when Joanna Drucker from UCLA is going to be speaking about uh, her involvement with the University of Virginia Spec Lab and how that relates to humanistic studies. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, I always try to give a plug for uh, the funding agencies that are sponsoring this uh, lecture series. Uh, I'm going to read this so I get their, their names exactly right. Uh, it is generously funded by the Mario M. Marino Fund for Innovation and Application of Advanced Information Technologies and the David R. Bender Endowment Fund for Library Staff Development. So we are grateful to those folks for uh, making this possible for us. Uh, our speaker this afternoon uh, is Tara McPherson. Uh, she is a member of the faculty at the University of Southern California where she teaches courses in new media, television, and popular culture in the University School of Cinematic Arts. Uh, she's the author of several very well-received books and uh, she is also the founding editor of Vectors, uh, a multimedia peer-reviewed journal sponsored by the Institute for Multimedia Literacy at the University of Southern California. Uh, if you haven't tried the, Vic the Vectors website, I urge you to do so. It's like nothing else you have ever seen in the scholarly, in the scholarly world. Uh, it, it really takes full advantage of multimedia and uh, all all kinds of things, and I believe she's going to talk some about vectors this, this afternoon. Uh, I had the, the opportunity to hear uh, Tara at uh, the Coalition for Network Information meeting a couple of years ago, and uh, she, was, she was the hit of the meeting. It, she, she gave one of the keynote speeches at the, at the meeting, and it was uh, really fascinating, and uh, so we were very pleased that she is able to uh, join us uh, this afternoon and uh, tell us about her experience. So please welcome Tara McPherson. Thanks. Um, I'm going to thank Tim and the staff here at the library for um, arranging for the visit and putting the talk together. And it's great to hear that I'm in um, the company of fellow presenters who I know pretty well, um, several of whom were recently at USC for our NEH fellowship that we hosted Institute this summer, which um, will be recurring again next summer, and by the end of the talk, um, I'll tell you a little bit about it. But I wanted to get a sense of where folks in the room are actually from, since I typically these days find myself speaking to a cross-section of university types that don't always play nicely together. So um, it, it's useful for me to know, you know, kind of where the audience is from. So if you work in the libraries, will you raise your hand? That, that, I'm seeing more and more of those hands these days, right? I'm scaring away the scholars, right? Um, if you're a humanities scholar, and if you're a humanities scholar who doesn't use technology already in the analysis or construction of your work in some kind of deep level, one, okay, so that's, and you know, I, you know, I always imagine myself speaking to rooms full of Peters, right, you know, um, converting um, um, the unwashed technological hordes into something else, right? But um, that never happens when the talk is called the digital humanities, right? So maybe um, uh, after today, you know, if I'm giving a talk on some of the things my books are on, you know, I have regular humanity scholars, right? But if I'm talking about something with digital in the title that's not theory, 
Um, I don't, right? So I, I would actually love to continue the conversation some of us had started over lunch as, as I wrap up and think about why that might be. But um, my audience today is pretty much, or most days, is as likely to be technologists, librarians, archivists, and foundation folks um, as humanities scholars from the kind of tribes I occupy as a humanities scholar. Um, and while the work I'm involved in in places like Vectors is deeply technological, um, it's not motivated by a kind of fascination with the technology or concerns that are themselves deeply technological. Rather, the work that I'm undertaking with a group of really amazing colleagues in places like Vectors and now in a project funded by the Mellon Foundation um, is animated by the same concerns that drive most politically engaged interpretive humanity scholars. You know, that's my kind of home tribe. Um, particularly those people who are interested in pursuing questions of race, of gender, of embodiment, and social justice. Kind of tag metadata for my print work, right? The digital projects that I'm involved with, the several over the past decade, are all motivated by the belief that the gap between digital platforms and interactive networks on the one hand, and the philosophical and political questions that drive the humanities on the other, that we need to address that gap. They exist in separate realms, I increasingly believe, to our own peril often divorcing questions of the human and the ethical from incre increasingly and equally important questions about access and preservation. I'd like to see these two impulses, the impulse to analyze, to make meaning, and the impulse to preserve and distribute wed more closely and explicitly together in our technological infrastructures. Technology could help us do that, but there are a lot of barriers to overcome. For the most part, the humanities scholars that we work with at a place like Vectors are not especially engaged with the technological. They're uh, not likely to know the fine differences between RDF and XML. They know nothing of text encoding, and they've probably never heard of the TerraGrid, let alone imagined how they might make use of it to better understand, say, um, feminist authorship in 19th century literature. These are scholars who typically produce print monographs, um, increasingly for 200 of their closest friends, um, and who are more likely to uh, critique the social effects of technology than willingly use it in their own work, except, of course, beyond word processing, um, research on the internet, and email. They've come of age in a scholarly moment in the humanities that actually makes them distrustful of the technological and even of the empirical. They're likely to be dismissive of certain forms of humanities computing, um, attributing humanities computing to an impulse to flee both feminist and scholars of color when they entered departments like history and English in the 80s and 90s. However, I think we're at a point where this scholar, this um, um, fantastical feminist humanity scholar I'm sketching, must necessarily participate in broader conversations around our digital future and even begin to rethink the very forms of her own scholarly productions. So today, by way of making this argument and building it out, I want to tell you about how I became involved in emerging forms of scholarly communication, of publishing. Um, I think in um, the mid-1990s, I was a brand le newly minted PhD teaching at a place called MIT um, in the humanities and in gender studies, which was already a weird combination, right? Um, when a student burst into my office um, circa 1992 and showed me this new thing he had made called a home page. And um, as someone who studies images and media culture, I was kind of taken, right? Um, this student's name was Joaquin. He was a cross-dresser from Texas, Latino, um, unusual already in many ways at MIT, who liked to come to class in a cheerleader costume, right? And um, Joaquin quickly began to use um, this new homepage to actively sculpt a space of identity, his many identities, um, that he could disseminate in the world in ways that he found hostile to do at MIT's campus, right? So I think Joaquin hooked me on the web from early on. 
I was already using the internet in archaic fashions like Pine and listservs and Elm to communicate with my technologist husband who was in Chicago. And um, I got pretty caught up in the heady days of Silicon Valley, you know, circa 1998, and the predictions that um, scholarly publishing, indeed all publishing, all culture, you know, was about to transform radically, right? And I believed it, right? And um, was willing to kind of participate in this, this heady new digital future. Um, sadly, that revolution has not fully come to pass, right? I think it's come to pass in the vernacular, you know, as, as we troll YouTube looking for, you know, whatever, right? And as we engage a variety of social networking platforms like Facebook, um, now taken over by old folks like us and not the, 18-year-olds who created it. Um, but in scholarly um, realms, change comes much more slowly, right? And um, scholarly publishing today in the humanities does not look dramatically different um, than it did um, 10 years ago, right? There are some examples, I think, of um, online publication that um, are quite um, interesting, right? This is a snapshot from the early days of 2000 when um, long before YouTube was you know, a dream of in you know, Murdoch's um, acquisitional eye, um, scholars were beginning to think, gee, wouldn't it be great if we could put text, image, and even video together in one space, right? And that seems so commonplace now in the land of Blogger and WordPress as to seem um, you know, um, trivial, right? But this, at the time, was um, quite stunning in 2000, right? Nine years ago, right? And um, the, the kind of work and infrastructure and library support, dare I say, that went into the creation of this journal, which did embed a variety of video clips in, into its kind of textual analysis. Um, um, that, that labor was intensive and expensive, right? And it's been supplanted quite handily now by a number of commercial off-the-shelf technologies. So while I'm not gonna address the tension between our homegrown university open source efforts and things that emerge from the commercial realm, um, say the, the difference between GIS as the universities developed it and Google, and Google Earth, um, those are questions I think we might want to come back to. What's the stake of scholars in the university in, in walking the fine line between commercially generated software and things we might produce at home, right? So as I arrived at USC, I was lucky to encounter a dean who um, was quite enthusiastic about beginning to think about new forms of scholarly production. I teach in a building called Lucas, as in George Lucas, right? At at the USC Cinema School. So the people there think a lot about moving images and, and um, media in general. And my dean had managed to convince George that the future literacies of the 21st century, even back in 1994, 95, were gonna depend on a broad kind of literacy that included an understanding of both time-based media and image-based media. Um, now we've added to that picture networked media, right? And he helped create an institute that became the home of this journal at USC called the Institute for Multimedia Literacy, where we began to think through um, from, um, as my dean says, cradle to grave, how we might retool various imaginations about what it meant to read, write, produce, author in the 21st century. And um, we work, I work both on K6 initiatives through that institute, and at the other end of the, of the kind of line I work with scholars, helping them rethink their scholarly practice. And it's much easier to work with eight-year-olds than it is with the 62-year-old history professors. And we could talk about why that is as well as we move ahead. So um, in the space of time we've been doing the kind of work that we've undertaken, um, this journal's defunct now. You won't be able to find it. We could talk about why that's true of many digital media projects as well. But um, the, um, in the space of time that I've been doing this work, the, um, the emphasis has shifted to a kind of new um, tagline, and that's the digital humanities, right? Very few people were using that term in 96 to describe the work that many of us now see that we're engaged in. But we moved from the computational humanities toward digital humanities fairly recently. And many of you in the library community, at least, are probably very aware of the broad interest in this term today, right? From the Mellon Foundation and ACLS, 
to NEH's new Office of the Digital Humanities, which funds a variety of projects, including some of mine, right? Um, and, but this humanities computing has a long tradition in um, various places at universities. And I want to kind of briefly walk you through some of that, um, although it may be familiar to the audience here, right? And push toward how we might start to think about joining um, various different impulses that I think we're on the cusp of now, including in particular for the folks I work with in the humanities, the insights of visual studies, of a field that's really come of age at the same time as digital humanities, but which has very rarely intersected with the technological. And it's a conundrum I find curious, and at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll explore some options we're working on now to, to kind of get the visual studies community actually using technologies of visualization, right, rather than to write about the visual field. So um, the, the kind of end point we're moving toward is to think about how these different impulses might be joined. But in that kind of brief typology of the digital humanities, I'd say the oldest tribe amongst us are um, the computing humanities. And I would put TEI here, although TEI folk might not, right? But you know, um, around about 19, the late 1960s or early 70s, um, a subset of humanity scholars who worked with more quantitative data often, or with large corpus of text they wanted to be able to perform interesting operations on, right? Um, began to recognize that the, these kind of desktop computers and mainframe computers being disseminated by places like IBM offered a real possibility for understanding the human record in a different way. This was often generated by a kind of um, empirical or scientific motivation, right? And there was a, um, a real need to kind of um, um, understand things quantitatively, right? That impulse is actually the impulse that alienated many of the scholars I want to try to work with, right? Who came of age, you know, after C.P. Snow's divide of the two cultures and who look at anything scientific or empirical with innate distrust, right? As if their, um, their you know, ideology is embedded in it, right? So um, the, the kind of computing humanity scholars um, both used the kind of scientific impulses of the computer to quantify and analyze, but also began to work quite um, compellingly in places like libraries doing these kinds of tasks, you know, digitizing the human record, right? Um, long before any humanities scholars of my group understood the affordances of the computer for very mundane research tasks, libraries were on it, right? And providing us with really amazing access to everything from digitized archives to JSTOR, right? And scholars, humanity scholars who were skeptical of everything when it's proposed, right, um, greeted JSTOR with great skepticism, and I think virtually no scholar I know now could imagine doing their work without the vast digital materials that are available to us, right? But again, this is in a really short chunk of time if you take the long arc of the university, right? You know, a decade. Um, and some of these projects are, you know, incredibly compelling, and the um, examples of them, um, this crowd I'm sure knows, but I'll, I'll pull up the Blake Archive. Have people used the Blake Archive? A few folks, right? Um, it's a... Um, always happens, right? Well, 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 Firefox takes over my machine in a way that, you know, didn't ever happen four years ago, right? Sometimes this takes forever. Hopefully it will do it quickly, right? Um, the um, Blake Archive brings together a kind of massive um, array of resources around William Blake in it searchable way, allowing annotation, scholarly glossing, um, different humanities scholars and um, their students work with this. There's kind of built-in mechanisms for tiered peer review. And it's a resource that's widely, widely available, right? It's, it's used fairly extensively. Um, I think it represents sort of the best of the humanities computing impulse um, circa 1998, 99, you know, the kind of vision of where that was going. It's trying so hard to do it. There we go. So, um, 
Um, and the look of it, you know, also is sort of 1999, right? It has, you know, it's amazing how quickly the visual aesthetics of the internet have dated, you know. Um, not having time to update my own web page that looks remarkably like this, I've just taken it offline, right? Rather than create something that looks current with, you know, the post web 2.0 aesthetic, I, you know, I've given up and you could find my web address and that's about it, right? But um, the, the materials here are rich and useful. I'm not gonna click us through it because there are other places I wanna go, but, um, I think that, you know, in, in kind of the twinned impulses that structure the digital humanities, a more recent tribe of upstarts are the blogging humanities scholars, right? Um, has anybody not read a blog? You know, no, even, even the most technologically resistant humanities scholars, you know, I talk to now, um, understand that the blogosphere exists, right? But the impulses that motivate bloggers in the humanities are different than the impulses that motivate the computing humanist for the most part, right? Um, the, it's very text heavy, you know, you know that from your blogs even when video's embedded. So people like English and history scholars who write for a living took to it quite readily, right? It was an easy form to segue to. Um, in its most experimental forms, it's now opening up the possibility of expanding archaic institutions like peer review to what we might understand as peer-to-peer -peer review. If you Google Kathleen Fitzpatrick and um, the words planned obsolescence, you'll find online her new book um, released um, through a WordPress um, plugin with comment fields um, before her book itself is coming out, right, in part of now an ongoing series of experiments at MIT Press to think about how they can remap their own peer review processes in a more open and transparent way. So like no um, Noah Wardrop Fruin's book, Except, um, Expressive Processing, and Ken Wark's book before that, all three have been released pre-publication in a comment press form that allows readers to come in and tag and interact with the text in advance of its print publication. Um, and all, all three books will morph and change a bit in the process, and Noah Wardrop Fruin has written quite interestingly about the difference in the peer-to-peer -peer review process he underwent and the traditional peer review process his book underwent at MIT Press. So some very interesting things about what happens in networked forms of knowledge production are emerging from this kind of blogging humanist impulse. And we'll just really quickly look at Crooked Timber, or slowly, you know, depending on the computer. But um, the um, most of the blogging kind of platforms exist on commercial software platforms, many of them free, but them owned, you know. Um, they don't have permanence in the way that um, warms the hearts of librarians, right? They come and go. Tim and I were talking a bit about some projects you have here that are doing versioning, which is, I think is a really interesting solution to some of the questions around preservation and access, which seem to smack really roughly up against um, the kind of um, fast generative production of text that happens in spaces like the blogosphere. Um, so, you know, Crooked Timber is a great collection of a wide variety of academic blogs. And you know, whether these things are scholarship or something else is a big debate right now, and I think an interesting one, but also not the one I'm gonna kind of follow through with today. I think that closed. Um, so I wanna talk about a third way, something else that we might understand as joining some of the impulses of the computing humanist and their kind of archival and data crunching um, impetus and the blogging humanists who largely operate at the surface of the screen, right, and in a text-heavy way. And um, really think about what would happen if you joined together the massive capacity of computers to architect information in new and illuminating ways, um, to network scholarly writing, to, to really kind of advance peer-to-peer -peer commentary, 
while also leveraging what those of us in media and visual studies understand to be uh, a kind of um, golden age of the visual and the aural, right? A kind of um, modes of communication pegged by McLuhan in the 60s as sort of rapidly changing sort of systems of knowledge transmission, right? And we have a lot of scholars in the humanities who have devoted the last 50 years to a very detailed, nuanced understanding of these forms. But very rarely are they in conversation with the kind of digital humanities folks who are building the kind of infrastructures we'll continue to work in. So um, there's some you know, different aspects of the multimodal scholar that I think are useful to consider. First of all, the computer is multi-purpose. I mean, it's, it's kind of core definition is as a multi-purpose machine, right? Um, um, rather than say, you, know, you might say a pen is a multi-purpose machine or a pencil, but a computer is multi-purpose in a different sort of way, right? And it can simultaneously be a platform that connects things, a medium in itself, a display device, Right, and I would, you know, um, urge us toward a version of the digital humanities that takes advantage of all of those affordances of the computer. I think the computer also, and particularly in the case of the things I'll show you soon, ask us to think very carefully about the relationship of form to content. Um, Parse differently, you might say, expression to idea. Right. Um, Books have many varieties of ideas, but they typically in the humanities have one or two forms, right? A form which is quite linear, a form that's incredibly naturalized after 100 years of use, so we don't even think about it unless we're a book historian when we pick it up, right? But um, that form of the book, um, positions, you might say constraints, thinking and writing in very particular ways. And we train people to produce to that form um, that might not always be um, the most organic in relationship to thinking or how you solve problems, right? So um, one of the things multimodal scholarship does is really think about this relationship of expression um, to idea. Um, we're interested in new forms of literacy, what it means to really understand not only um, new forms of the moving image, but also database architectures, right? And um, what the relationship between those two things might be. And um, the language of interactivity becomes increasingly important as well. So about um, eight years ago at the Institute for Multimedia Literacy at USC, where many of us were teaching with new technologies, and um, we're fortunate to participate in a very innovative program where highly skilled um, teaching assistants from the School of Cinematic Arts, who both studied theories of visual media and film and new production techniques, um, came to work in huma traditional humanities classrooms with a variety of professors, right? So you might be teaching 19th century literature and um, or, you know, kind of Buddhist religion, and you'd be working with a TA who understood sort of multimedia production. And that TA would work with your students to afford them the possibility to produce research that wasn't only um, written text, right? Although they did learn to write as well, right? So um, some students produced, you know, web pages. Um, a series of students in classics working with Bruce um, Zuckerman produced very elaborate 3D models, reconstructions of um, um, ruins, right? So, and they continued to work on that project for four years, the undergrads, after the class ended. So it was kind of catching, right? I've never had a student who wrote a paper for me um, asked to continue to work on it for four years, right? But there was a, a kind of animation of the students by, you know, this kind of process, right? So my dean, who is very um, kind of not I spent many years outside of the academy and is very open to other sort of ideas, said, well, why aren't scholars doing work like the students are doing? And I said, because A, you'd have no place to publish it, and B, you'd never get promoted if it's not published somewhere. And she said, well, start a journal, you know, have peer review, publish the stuff. And, you know, I said, Really? And she said, yeah. And I said, okay, we will, right? And we talked to a lot of people, including several who you've apparently had to campus. Kathleen Woodward was great in sort of um, helping us think through some of the risks and possibilities. And we realized that to be taken seriously, we'd have to work with quite senior scholars in the interpretive humanities. And none of them knew how to you know, do anything in new media. Some of them barely used email at the time um, in early in the 2000s. So we um, created a fellowship model by 
by which, um, through a national competition, scholars could apply to work with us. And they'd come to USC for a boot camp in the summer, about a week of a fairly intensive um, discussion around the digital humanities. And the very beginning of design conceptions on their project. And then they'd be assigned to a team for about six months over the next year at some point that included um, one of the editors from the journal, Steve Anderson or I, one of our designers at the time when we started, Eric Loyger, Eric Lawyer and Reagan Kelly, both um, new media artists and designers, and our information architect, a very, very young guy named Craig Dietrich. And over the space of about three months, this team of three or four would iteratively, through phone conversations, now through Skype, create scholarly work, right? So this, the scholars didn't tell us what they wanted and we built it for them. Instead, um, there was a very rich, deep collaboration across skill sets of designers, technologists, and humanists, right? And that, that kind of collaborative process was really um, transformative for us and for the folks we worked in, worked with. And, um, you know, the kind of tagline, because um, we live in Hollywood and we, you know, learn the art of the pitch. There's actually a class at USC where you teach the pitch, right? Can you imagine if you did that with humanity scholars? Okay. No, get, no, 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 get it down to a sentence, right? Um, <laughs> Vectors doesn't publish work that could exist in print, right? And that could mean many things, but it means, you know, we don't publish things that are print-based. I'm not sure I closed that last window in my mouse slippage and a new one won't open if I didn't with the joys of So I'm just gonna quickly show you vectors. Has anybody seen vectors? Any of you looked at it? Um, I'll tell you in advance, it's not your regular journal, and um, it's not even your regular website, and um, people find it hard and opaque and challenging, and um, it's supposed to be, and I'll hope to explain to you a little bit why, right? So um, we launched in 2005, and um, we had many meanings, as I'm sure most of you kind of have been in as well, where your university tells you that if you're gonna live on their server, these are the things you must do, right? And so to live on USC server, we had to have that ugly bar across the top that says University of Southern California. Those, those requirements have lessened a little bit in the past, but you know, circa 2002, that was a requirement. And it immediately flew in the face of our designer, Reagan Kelly's desire for the interface, right? So she and Eric decided, well, if we're gonna have to have that, let's use it as a lesson, right? Because this is a journal that you don't read necessarily. This is a journal you interact with. And we want people to get that from the second they enter, right? So to get into the journal proper, you have to play with this Etch-a-Sketch kind of interface. And you don't really, you could really just click through it. but. Um, you know, people typically do play with it. And it begins to, um, I think, skill the reader into a sense that something slightly different is afoot here, right? So this is, this is one of the issues of vectors. It's, um, you know, the articles such as they are are arranged over here, right? And um, I'll just in a couple of minutes give you a tour of a few projects. Um, the one I almost always start with is, um, probably one of our most traditional pieces because I think it sort of um, eases particularly people like provost and department chairs um, into um, starting to think this might be okay, right? Because it doesn't look too alien. And this project is called The Unmaking of Markets. It's done by a sociology professor, Rebecca Imig, who's more quantitative than some of the scholars we worked with, but who is also, um, uses a kind of blend of interpretive and quantitative methods, right? So she's a sociolog uh, sociologist who studies medieval Italy, right? She's also a historian. And her kind of research problem that she brought to us was that she studies um, the transition of northern and southern Italy to capitalism, and they transit to capitalism at very different rates. And you know, this is something scholars of Rebecca's ilk have puzzled over for a while. 
Um, she's been working, she's now done with a book that explains her hypotheses around this. But in coming to her conclusions, she put together a massive amount of data, not all of which is in the book, and all of which she realized when she tried to talk about it, tended to make her audiences fall asleep. You know, it was not dynamic, it did not really illustrate the kind of visual components that were compelling to her about the story she was trying to tell. So this is very early days, and she proposes to us kind of creating a series of visual composites that in a kind of an overview snapshot would provide her argument um, distilled and consolidated that the book could then open back up, right? So she wanted to think about how in a kind of visual snapshot you might produce a set of information that in its, would make meaning in a way slightly different than the text itself might, and they would contribute to each other. So in some ways this is incredibly traditional because on the left-hand side you have Rebecca's argument and you could pretty much just click through you know, that argument. What you have over on the right here are land use and title documents that she's drawing from, from archives in Italy that you could kind of look at and play with in different ways. Um, and then a series of sort of um, um, arguments unfolding on your left. But this is one of her first composites. And in it, she's kind of um, using an array of um, techniques, photography of contemporary Italy, um, um, a kind of approximation of the division of land at the time she's studying in this particular area in Italy. The patterns of land holding became very important for how she understood the transmission of both literacy and eventually of markets, right? So all these elements are kind of connected together. So she puts together in each snapshot, one for northern, one for southern Italy, um, details about the way things like the positioning of the church, the distribution of plots of land shift from north to south, and how you could start to read off these landscapes, the contours of the argument she'll make in a very dense theoretical book, right? So the visual composite is meant to accompany the other work, not to kind of stand alone from it. And then we also started in a very kind of tiny way that largely failed, but that I still find really interesting, to start to play with what, um, you might call um, sort of simulations of what's happening in um, Italy at the time. So she had all this data to draw from, and these aren't real-time simulations, they're faked, right? They're, they're algorithms we've written to sort of start to allow you to understand the different way land ownership consolidated very quickly under a lord, right, in different parts of Italy. And in that kind of transition of land holding, um, possibilities for different um, access to literacy was also scaffolded, right? And that, that kind of impacts how markets develop. So these, um, you know, a social scientist would recoil in horror, right? They're meant to be suggestive, they're not real, right? But we wanted to begin to speculate on what would happen if you could allow humanity scholars to start to think about simulation as one form of argument, right? Not as your research analysis, but actually as the presentation of arguments. Students find this stuff really compelling, right? Because they've spent a lot of time doing things like The Sims and Sim City, and they understand the logic of simulation intuitively at some level already. So that's you know, a first project from this issue. Um, these are both the very first issues. So they're, you know, um, this is 2005. They already you know, feel dated in some ways, but in other ways not, right? So this is a project by Alice Gambrell, who's a literary scholar who studies both um, the materiality of the book and her anxi the anxieties of folks as um, text workers, the people who produce text of all kinds, books and secretarial, right? As, they, as that profession became feminized in the early 20th century and women became the te text workers, you could read off an array of cultural documents a kind of anxiety about the feminization of text, right? And her, she's also working on a book that looks at these things, largely in a fairly traditional historical literary analysis, right? That situates the reading of several novels where you could intuit anxieties about text workers from Henry James to Anne Petrie, right? Um, in a kind of larger set of historical and cultural shifts um, dealing with, you know, kind of um, 
technologization in the early 20th century and modernity, right? So um, Alice, in writing this book, collected, as many of us do, you know, a massive amount of evidence, things she was using, right? This issue is on evidence. And she wrote the book, and almost none of those things ended up in the book, but she knows that she wouldn't have come to her argument if she hadn't had all this stuff to think with, right? So she asked us to help her build an archive, a database, that would allow her to pay homage, a kind of loving tribute to the stuff, right? And allow people to explore it and see what she thought about it, right? So um, does anybody know what stolen time is? It's a business phrase. Stolen time is what you do when you're on the clock and you're on Zappos buying shoes or on Facebook with your niece, right? And you know, people who manage corporations are very anxious about stolen time, right, these days, right? Um, USC now has some keystroke programs in some departments, you know, meant to kind of make sure you're not, not working, right? So all of this is a kind of background for, for Alice's piece. And she worked on this. Eric Lawyer worked with um, Rebecca Imig. Um, Reagan Kelly worked with Alice on this piece. And Alice, um, Alice wanted to be playful because she wanted to celebrate the ways in which text workers um, were um, able to get around the constraints of the workplace, able to have fun, right? Part of her collection is a massive collection of zines from the 80s that were made on, you know, technology borrowed at work, you know, Xerox machines, and circulated, right, as a kind of workers' resistance to temp jobs, right? So um, she wanted a kind of playful spirit, but Reagan felt like in the design of the piece, she wanted to also capture that surveillance, sort of punitive aspect of, of text work, right? So do you all know what these are? Who knows what shorthand characters, right? My mother was a secretary, so I particularly love this piece. That opening screen is a set of stories that users enter, and my mother's story's in there somewhere as I, as I parsed it, right? So, you know, you, you click in, and then you have to practice your shorthand, and it's really hard on the screen, and you really don't have to do it at all, right? But um, those little orange spaces are my mistakes, right? So you're seeing what you're not doing right. And then you enter in. And you know, so Alice, you know, in her book is exploring how things like cataloging systems were a kind of form of knowledge that were incredibly important in the early 20th century to organizing culture and you know, kind of whole epistemological structures. So she's you know, kind of borrowed the conceit of the catalog to start to, to play with some of you know, these um, things. So in the archive, there are hundreds and hundreds of pieces of things she's collected, most of them scanned images and text. And some of them are you know, kind of um, didactic materials produced for secretaries. Some of them are toys. Some of them are kind of cartoons from culture. Um, down at the bottom is sort of Alice's gloss on um, these pieces, their provenance and her interpretation of them. Um, in the archive as a whole, there's probably as much text as is in her book, but it's different text, and it's, it's atomized in a way that's very different than the kind of linear structure of a book. So if you were to say that this piece had an argument, which I would argue it does, it's an argument that's emergent. It's not an argument you find in an intro or conclusion. It's an argument you find through interaction, through a kind of um, loving attention to the piece, which I think is an interesting kind of distinction to hold on to. So I'll just give you a, a kind of snapshot of a few other things that are in here, right? Um, a lot of ads. Um, Fascinating books from secretaries, right, for secretaries teaching them how to behave and how to type and how not to waste a single motion of the pen, how to speed up, right? So um, you start to accumulate um, on the left here um, a kind of snapshot of the things you looked at, except the snapshot doesn't appear if you haven't read Alex's text, right, or Alice's text. So, um, and you'll, you'll figure that out as you work with the interface. Um, if you come to a piece like this, obviously expecting to understand it in the way you would a scholarly article, um, there's a level of frustration involved. I would argue no greater than the level of frustration that I found when I started reading Deleuze after you know, a continental philosophy background, right? But, um, you know, we, we're naturalized to certain forms of knowledge, right? So in my field, Foucault seems easy, right? But for those same scholars who very much appreciate Foucault, and they're there, right? Um, 
this is hard, right? And so um, I, one of the purposes of vectors is not only to explore new forms of writing and thinking in relation to databases, but to also explore how um, the interfaces we interact with condition us to see certain things and not see others. So the interface design is meant to kind of underscore some of those issues. Um, when you clock out, you get a kind of Xerox of the thing that um, you've produced on the left. Um, you could track object histories through that. Um, you um, have been clocked through the whole process, so you could see how long you've been here. Um, you could see a map that shows sort of parts of the database you touched and how you moved around through it in different ways. Um, I doubt anyone has ever interacted with this piece in a way that they saw every bit of it, right? That also, um, I think, knocks roughly against some expectations of the scholarly, right? That, um, you know, I, many people who've spent time with the pieces have said to me, I'm really nervous that I didn't see it all. And I said, well, um, get used to it, right? <laughs> Welcome to the 21st century, right? There's um, a real tension, I think, between the scholarly impulse to catalog and know all and the proliferation of these digital forms, which make makes that nearly impossible, right? And to start to understand how you um, use machines to do part of the work for you or um, begin to make intelligent guesses, I think is increasingly important um, in the digital modes we're in now. So um, let me show you one wacky piece just um, because there, well, actually, I'll show you Sharon's piece because it's sound driven. This piece was produced with a media scholar and activist named um, Sharon Daniel, who teaches at UC Santa Cruz. And um, Sharon, um, it's going to start talking in a second. Sharon works um, within prisons in California, women's prisons, um, doing what amount to kind of oral history projects um, around testimony with women prisoners. Okay. And um, this piece is almost, an, this is a very, very extensive archive. It's hundreds of hours of archival audio footage. And um, it's organized in an algorithmically driven database structure that Sharon created with Eric Lawyer. Um, it's slightly different most times you interact with it, so you can't version it in quite the same way. You know, we like to think about additions, right? Several of the pieces and vectors, even though you might notice it, it might not notice it at first, are different in different iterations, or they change depending on what you've chosen as you move through the piece, because they all depend on the database structure. Well, they look like text on the screen. They're, they're driven through information architecture. So I'll let you listen to a little bit of her intro. Maybe. Actually, a $3 million can you crank it? separates California Correctional Women's Facility from the middle of nowhere. Its site is an agribusiness desert between Los Banos and Chowchilla, where there are three prisons within 30 square miles. Past the metal detector, through two electronic gates, under the gaze of the gun towers, there is an uncannily suburban, perfectly manicured lawn. Between the fence and the visiting room, I follow a rose-lined path surrounded by razor wire glinting in the relentless heat. This space is a counter site, intended to reinscribe the symbolic order of the space of the prison as safe, calm, domesticated. The prison is an anamorphosis, like the Memento Mori in Holbein's painting, The Ambassadors, in which a smear or blot. Um, as you start to enter it, um, the very beginning of it is scripted. So the very beginning of it will always take a certain structure as you enter into it. The same things will appear on the screen, right? But this is using a kind of um, algorithm that produces tree maps, you know, that produces different things in, in kind of relational kind of shapes and sizes that, Sher that Eric wrote as Sharon described to him the conceptual <coughs> underpinnings of the work she wants to do. And she operates between artistic practice, she does gallery shows, um, and theoretical practice, she writes, right? So she's already a very interesting hybrid scholar. Um, and um, 
as you move through the piece, depending on what you choose to interact with first, different um, dynamically driven screens will load in, right? So it, it kind of shifts based on, you know, kind of a guessing of what the, the kind of reader is doing. So um, the main structure of the piece are the women's voices that she works with. Can you turn it up just a little? You can't hear it very well, but this is a woman um, talking about um, contracting AIDS um, in prison um, after, after being attacked by someone on the yard. But um, you could read the transcripts. You could follow a particular woman's story through the piece in different ways. Um, there are a variety of um, sort of different ways to move into it. But you could also work through a series of themes that Sharon's theoretical argument about prisons depends upon. And the argument, again, emerges from an interaction with the pieces as you, you start to intuit the relationship of the sound files she's architected and chosen with the kind of thematic framework she's, she's um, created. Um, no one was more surprised than those of us at Vectors, when um, this piece was a Webby Awards nominee, that's kind of like the, the kind of Oscars for new media kind of work, and um, it's usually quite commercial or public service oriented work, not kind of weird humanity scholars art hybrid stuff. But the piece has had a very interesting life traveling far outside of academic and art circles. It's used quite actively by the um, um, prison abolition kind of prisoner freedom movement that Sharon's a part of, um, Justice Now, a group that Angela Davis works closely with at Santa Cruz, um, has used the piece quite a bit. Um, Sharon's ended up in a number of um, quite interesting conversations with scholars, uh, with activists who've stumbled upon the piece online. Um, that, that experience has been replicated across many of the scholars we've worked with, um, including Minu Ma'alam, who's a transnational feminist scholar who works on Iran, who's the chair of gender studies at Berkeley, who did a piece with us exploring the role, the kind of function of the Persian carpet in the way Americans construct an image of the Middle East. Right? And she's now entered into these kind of ongoing long conversations with guys who run Persian carpet stores in you know, Virginia and LA who found the piece through Google searches and were fascinated, right? So, and she comments quite thoughtfully on how unpredictable it was to her that her very kind of rarefied feminist scholarship that she understands she produces for a very tiny community of scholars, right, might begin to exist in the public in a different way through formats like this. And I think that's, you know, a kind of another um, kind of theme we might want to talk about as, you know, I, as I finish up. But I'm going to go back into the slideshow now. It's like a cheat sheet for everything I've said. So, um, the scholars we've worked with have found the experience um, fairly transformative, right? Um, David Lloyd, who's a well-known post-colonial and Irish studies scholar who worked with us on issue two, um, um, found, said what he found was that this, the, the modes of his writing, and he recognized this also to mean the modes of his thinking, shifted when he was no longer writing for the linear, right? Because he's, he's a beautiful writer, and he said, you know, I've learned over years that writing is a subordinate activity, right? That I create thoughts that carefully are subordinated you know, the, to the thing that you know, comes after, and, and it arcs through an essay. And I found it um, very challenging and nearly impossible to atomize that prose in the way you were asking me to for my piece. But once I had done it, I realized, you know, he studies Joyce, right? And he said, you know, this is how I think. This is what I love. This is how I was meant to write in a citational way that jumped from space to space. 
and the academy won't allow me to write that way, but a database can, even if the surface of the screen feels like something else. So he's very interested in exploring the kind of associative logics that might emerge from um, a database thinking. And, and that happens in the juxtaposition of the database to the screen, right? When um, the reason that we don't build projects for scholars, but co-create them with scholars, is a lot of the payoff happens when a scholar starts to understand that what looks like a spreadsheet, a grid that is the database tool we've created, um, is changed in different ways, and our tool makes it very easy to change. That impacts the surface of the screen in particular ways, and that there are various things you could start to understand from that database structure. So after scholars have entered a lot of information in the database structure, we have two visualizers that let them see the database structure in a way that's not like, you know, a, that doesn't look like an Excel interface. And both of those are kind of um, like think maps where they start to draw the connections between the um, relations you've encoded in the database. And seeing, Manu will say, when I looked at this, I saw there was a whole cluster of ideas over here that weren't connected to anything else. And I never would have seen that in my book, because the way my book is organized. But when I saw that those ideas weren't connected to anything else, I thought, oh God, I've got to think about these things. These are important. Why aren't they connected up to anything else I'm writing about, right? And rewrote whole sections of what would become the print work based on sort of having seen the relationship of our ideas, right? And um, I think many scholars find that these forms are actually more um, organic to how interpretive humanities scholars work, where they'll have in their method um, a big chunk of stuff, usually scraps of paper, backs of envelopes, outlines, right, and shuffle those around, right, that used to be index cards. Right? And um, when you're forcing those into the linear spine of a book, the things that don't somehow cohere, you just put in a folder called next book, right? And what a database form does is allow you to explore multiple vectors at once with an interface that could still make that multiplicity coherent, right? Or followable or navigable. And it also allows multiple people to work together. So, you know, David Lloyd is interested in a second project that would allow a kind of citational practice to accrete from many scholars working on kind of shared work, but in an experimental form. So we're starting to also get a sense of sort of genres that might crystallize out of this very wacky experimental work we've been doing. We know that a lot of scholars are interested in um, what we might call interactive documentary, a way that you could kind of explore many kind of facets of a topic through an interactive space. Um, Sharon's piece I would locate there. Also sort of spatialized essays, essays which allow you to um, look at um, different content in um, spaced chunks, right? As well as sort of possibilities for, you know, kind of imagining what simulation, simulation or visualization would do. Um, for the work we've done so far, I think um, process has emerged as, as important as what happens at the end. I mean, the thing we fetishize in academe is that final print book from a respected university press that um, sells 347 copies on average these days, right? Um, likely to shrink as library budgets do, right? But um, I don't think any of the scholars I know think the book is what they do, right? What they do is the thinking that is embodied and, and fossilized in that book, right? And I think these new media forms give us the possibility to begin to think process in kind of lively new ways um, and push us toward um, collaboration in, in different modes. And I think it, what we've kind of done with vectors is not so much build tools and then want scholars to come and use them, but to work with scholars and decide you know, what tools work for the needs of the scholars. So nothing we've done in vectors is gonna work, some, work for someone who does really heavy statistical number crunching, right? That's, you know, um, and I think the, the kind of pipe dream of the Uber tool for the humanities that will do what everybody needs is exactly a pipe dream, right? That we need faster, flexible widgets, adaptions, interesting hybrids between commercial or vernacular tools and things we might build in house that make those work for us. I mean, there are huge risks to building our future on Google Earth and applications we might create to it since there'll be things we won't own, but um, 
we're not ever going to outstrip Google Earth in the kind of infrastructure they've put into place, right? So I think we need to be very wily about how we, you know, draw from multiple spaces and flexible, right? If I, you know, we were starting to build in the project I'm about to tell you about something huge and vast and heavy, by the time we finished it, YouTube would have already gotten there, right? So what do we do with what, say, YouTube has now to take us somewhere else? So here's some of the kind of stuff we're, we're working on right now. Um, our summer workshop, courtesy of the NEH, this summer had its first month-long institute. And this institute is meant not to start a long process of working with a vector scholar, but instead to jumpstart folks on grant applications in the core of a project that they might then take to their home institutions or to other funders. So we've worked um, out of the 11 scholars we had with us this summer, ranging from three graduate students to Catherine Hales, who's an endowed literature professor at, any, at Duke. Um, seven of them we've written subsequent grant applications with or sponsored their grants since August, right? So there's funding out there, but traditional humanities scholars don't yet know how to tap into it, right? So um, we'll be offering this summer institute again next summer. Next summer, we're gonna try a process in which a scholar would come with someone from their institution who might be, say, a technologist and a librarian, and they would come together to USC for the summer and start using some of our, our tools, right? And um, this summer, we were very fortunate to receive uh, an extension of a Mellon Foundation um, planning grant we had been working on, along with scholars from some other universities, um, NYU, San Diego, Rochester, and Brown. And in this um, proposal called um, the, Network, the Alliance for Networking Visual Culture, We've put together a small alliance of kind of human infrastructure to think about how you might transform scholarly workflow. And this is supposed to knit together several communities that don't often talk as much to each other as they might. At the beginning of the process we're mapping are several archives, um, some funded by Mellon, which have vast resources and the example we're working on, um, digitized video. So our partners are a small, um, archive at NYU called the Hemispheric Institute Archive, which is a collection of about a thousand hours of performance studies work from across the Americas um, that scholars work with, but typically just write about. They don't use the materials um, in any other way. Um, the Internet Archive's video holdings, which are pretty massive. Um, a very small bottom-up startup that my colleague Steve Anderson has started with the funding of the MacArthur Foundation called Critical Commons that is sort of a YouTube for media study scholars to load the clips they might use in teaching or research up to a space where their university won't get sued and then share them, annotate them, and use them with a community of scholars and students. And um, another archive called the Shoah Foundation, which has a really large collection of videos of survivor testimony. It happens to be at USC right now. And what we're doing with those partners is helping them imagine how they're already very carefully constructed, rich, data sets of video material, right, might be made different or better use of by the scholars that material was often created for, right? By creating a series of templates, for lack of a better word, or widgets that allow scholars to create vectors-like projects that are database structures laying over the databases already created by these archival institutions. So it becomes a way to allow, say, a set of scholars interested in um, homosexual sexuality in, um, you know, kind of concentration camps, right, to um, work together on the database of video from the Showa Foundation and produce a scholarly edition of multimedia work that draws from the archive at Showa. So, you know, these vast resources sit and can be sliced in different ways. Showa is stunned how many people, how few people actually use their material as video, right? Because it is a visual history in Spielberg's mandate, right? So, um, that's kind of um, the, the, 
networking of scholars through a series of working groups into the archive space. And the partner at the other end are three university presses, California, MIT, and Duke, which have agreed to publish um, the work um, in multimedia form of the eight scholars we'll work with in this two-year prototyping phase, right? Um, to address the kind of thorny questions of tenuring and promotion and academic credibility. And I think in, um, you know, the sort of view of the Mellon Foundation to really help presses rethink a fundamentally broken business model, right? Um, to ease them into at least the late 20th century, right? So, um, you know, there, um, a couple of libraries working with us as well, including NYU's library, because they're the housing, they house um, the Hemispheric Institute's collection and USC's library, which houses Showa. So just as a kind of sort of snapshot of something I think it's useful to think about as we push into a kind of different mode of thinking about what you do when you have a really well tagged, curated, stable, archival data structure, right? You know, this kind of thing people have labored over creating, which has a lot of material in it. Um, how can scholars use that new and differently, better, more interestingly, right? So this is, is text map. And what this um, search engine does is grab whatever you searched for. This was a search for Hurricane Katrina at a particular time, right? And each of these visualizations is a different interpretation of the same data feed. Right? So each of these interpretations is delivering what the raw data, the bit stream, you know, has <laughs> served up to the call. And you know, the form we're used to is one that looks more like the upper left, which is Google, right? which is the kind of dominant normalized interface for what the data search you know, returns. But these are all, you know, there are many, many, many ways we might visualize or slice through those data streams. Right? And um, you know, this, I think, is a, is a kind of provocative example of the very different hybrid structures we might have now that you know people like librarians and archivists have done some a massive massively hard and generous work to get the human record in the shape that it's in right um, Shoah is very interested in, in kind of exploring what some of this might mean. So this is a Google interface they've been playing with that you know you know they have they 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 employed um, you know, huge teams of catalogers working around the clock for over 10 years to hand tag all the video, you know, the thousands of hours of video that are in the Showa collection. Did anybody want to guess how big the Showa data collection is? You know, it's massive. It's bigger than the Sloan Astronomical Sky Survey in raw data. You know, people say humanities don't have big data sets, like, you know, guys, you know, how big's your data set, right? Humanities have the biggest data set of all, right? You know, we have the data set that's the human record, right? You know, what are we going to do with it, right? And, um, you know, Showa, um, there's a tension in Showa, right? Because Showa is an archive that has incredibly sensitive cultural material, right? Material that, you know, um, Folks who are, you know, um, organizing conferences around the world to deny the event they chronicle existed, right? So um, they they've entered into very delicate agreements with survivors to to make their memories available in respectful and, and carefully curated ways, right? But there's a, a 21st century culture of sort of openness and access that the closed, sealed, hermetically protected archive stands in really um, hard um, contradiction with. Right? So Showa's board and its directors are really trying to navigate carefully and respectively now to toggle between closed and open in kind of precious archival resources. Right? This is the kind of roadmap for the, for the um, Mellon grant and the kind of work that we'll be kind of creating to, to move from, to link the university archive and research groups together. And then, you know, these are just some of the things that I think are useful to keep in mind as we um, appeal to, you know, here I, I think I'm probably speaking to much of the choir, right? That as we, you know, go out and preach to the other folk. Um, you know, I think it's really important not to um, assume we know what people want to do with data or information and to make it available in ways that allow people to interact with it in a broad and wide um, variety of ways. Um, 
to think about our users as co-creating the things that we're um, producing. And Vectors in the past has not been so good about this, because even though it's wacky, it was more like an art gallery or a journal. Um, it didn't invite the user to co-create the material in it. So that's one of the kind of things we'll be thinking a lot more about as we move forward. Scholars generally are not, even though we pretend we are, are generally not so interested in other people taking over our interpretation. <laughs> we, we'd like to keep it fixed and right. But um, you know, I think that there's an opportunity there as well, right? Um, I think we need to assume that any kind of data stream should have multiple front ends. Some might be really, you know, you might take the Blake archive and have it be a search interface, but you might also now take that data and have it be a vectors project. And it's not that one is better than the other, it's that they have different purposes for different audiences. I think we have a lot to learn from the experimental and the artistic. I think you'll hear something quite similar from Joanna Drucker when she's here in the fall, in the spring, around you know, the experiments they undertook at Spec Lab, which are uh, a real cousin to vectors. Um, I think we need to value multimedia literacy and um, push you know, way into the machine. And, uh, none, when I was in college in the early 80s, we could take computer programming as, a, um, foreign, as our foreign language requirement. Right? And um, I took basic. I didn't really get it, really. I mean, I find it enormously helpful to have struggled through that class now because it helps me understand some core ways the world around us is really constructed. And I think if what humanity scholars are supposed to do is understand meaning in the world, those of us who at least study the present to understand meaning need to be literate at least in code. You know, maybe we need um, language and reading exams and, and you know, kind of information structures, databases, code, right, as a very generic part of education. I think one of the reasons the digital humanities are such a hard sell to traditional humanities scholars is that our universities don't reward sort of promiscuous interdisciplinarity really at all, right? Um, you might talk to a historian whose method is the same as yours if you're in a literature department, but you're not going to go talk if you're, you know, an art historian who's studies, you know, image in a particular way that's textual to someone in cognitive science. And you're certainly not going to talk to someone in the engineering school. And if you do, it'll probably just be to convince them that their work is complicit with the military industrial complex, right? So there's probably, you know, some kind of intellectual generosity demanded of um, a different future if we're going to realize some of the things that were implicit there. So, but I, you know, I feel heartened that there are folks like y'all there to kind of help fight the good fight too. So thanks. Uh, we have time for questions and discussion with Tara. There is a microphone here, which I'll try and dislodge from its stand and come to you. So please use the microphone because we are recording this. Thank you for that. That was wonderful. Um, I'm wondering, I have a lot of questions, but I'll just start with, a, with an easy one about archiving. Uh, I'm just curious, what, are, what are, you, are all of you at Vectors doing uh, in terms of archiving your own journal? Because clearly you're using technologies that are in process, always changing. I saw Flash up there. And yeah. it, it'll go through its many iterations. Have mm -hmm. you all, I, I assume you have all thought about that. I don't know what you're if you come up with some answers for that? I mean, we have thought about it. It's not an easy question, right? <laughs> easy one to ask, not an easy one to answer, right? And honestly, when we started, we weren't thinking about it. You know, the kind of ephemerality of it was not troublesome to us because it was a thought experiment to see what you know we might do. But fairly early in the creation of Vectors, um, when I encountered Cliff Lynch, who runs CNI, um, he invited me to do one of the small sessions at CNI, you know, when Vectors had just launched. And um, you know, I hadn't even, don't, don't scream, right, even applied for an ISSN number, right? Some librarian did it for me, right? Because we were just like doing what we did. This guy sends me an email and says, here's your number. I thought you might want one, right? I'd never met him, right? So this conference was my first clue that that um, quickly we should start talking to librarians and archivists and that um, um, 
we were kind of foolish not to have done that to begin with, right? Because I think the hard work most people do in buildings like this is fairly taken for granted and invisible to humanity scholars. You know, the only time we notice is when, you know, the book we want's not there, right? But um, I began a series of conversations with a variety of people coming out of, out of that um, first trip to CNI. And, um, the folks at Stanford who run LOCKS, which is a kind of archiving initiative, stands lots of copies, keep stuff safe, right? Um, Vectors was voted onto the island of LOCKS, and they've been, you know, in the small amounts of time with the resources they have trying to kind of figure out what to do. And there's not really a good answer for archiving Flash circa 2003. Right? So you could create snapshots of it. You can't really yet archive robust playable models. In the beginning, you couldn't even get the text out of it. Right? So um, as each iteration of Flash um, emerges, its compatibility with things like XML increase. So now you can, you know, in the beginning you couldn't have, it was encapsulated. You know, the, for the computer it was a black box and whatever was in it was not there, right? But um, now with Flash you could kind of export most of the content from images to other things out in a way that that could be archived and captured. You know, the kind of raw data. You can't archive the experience except on the emulator that some, you know, guy I'll have to build in a, you know, computer science class in 2015 in an, um, otherwise, right? So my husband's a, a technologist. He has a video game and animation company, and our house is littered with emulators for old video games, right? And somebody will have to build the emulators for dead scholarship eventually as well, right? So, you know, if the book has limitations, one of those limitations um, is not, um, rapid obsolescence, well maybe in content, but not in form, right? So it's, it's a really real hard question. We're trying not to rely on Flash too much, but they're not um, lots of compelling, you know, the, the templates, what we're working on with um, the Alliance from Ellen will not be Flash. It'll be a lot less artsy than, than vectors, but um, Flash is the platform for certain kinds of work that the journal space wants to occupy. Right? And there's a real question around bandwidth as well when we started because, you know, my mother's computer couldn't access the stuff we were building when the first issue went live, right? Yeah, again, thanks. Uh, it was really an uh, interesting talk. I just want to ask a nuts and bolts question mm -hmm. uh, for clarification's sake. Again, uh, I'm assuming that you have a team that uh, works with each submitter, correct? Uh -huh. And then uh, as far as the workflow, the process is concerned, I mean, is there uh, some sort of an understanding about the, the, the time frame, uh, what kinds of uh, software or hardware would be necessary? Uh, how, how exactly are those details and all those arrangements right. are made? Right. Those are good questions. In, this, in the issues that are up, I'd say two-thirds to three-fourths in any given issue is stuff we built in-house with a scholar, and the rest was submitted much like you would submit to a traditional journal, um, and then we either link to or house on our server those projects. They're you know, peer-reviewed, much like you know, a journal article. But for the things we build in-house, um, the work cycle is roughly three to six months, right, of, of act, you know, active team support for the scholar. And um, very little but beyond that commitment of resources is preordained, right? Um, for our own work process, we realized by the end of the first issue that one of the things we were building without knowing it was this database tool because we couldn't remake that new every time, right? So, you know, we know that as we move into a project and as we select fellows, that we want things that we have a sense would demand that kind of database structure, and then we use, you know, that platform we've created. But a lot of it's done really fast, on the fly, you know, very kind of boutique-y and iterative, not wildly scalable to supporting thousands of people, right? So um, the, the Mellon project's an attempt to kind of um, glean some lessons from the experiment we've had the kind of privilege to work on and think about how you might, without losing all the benefits of that tight working collaboration, 
port some of them to kind of more easily accessible and disseminatable platforms. No, but it's, um, many of the scholars we work with have no technological background or capacity at all. Right? So a few who come in have done a few small things. We worked with a graduate student who's now done, um, named Trevor Paglin, who's an artist and also a uh, um, geography PhD from Berkeley. And his work is around sort of um, the way certain spaces are created that we never see. Right? So one of the things he studies are the um, planes that aren't supposed to exist in the military. And when he worked with us, you know, rendition planes were not yet something that you know, was in the blogosphere. They were still much more secret than they are now in the kind of black world. I thought he was maybe having a paranoid fantasy when he applied. I wasn't quite sure these things really existed. And, and we built with him essentially what was a tracker of um, one of the feeds of these planes that come out of Virginia. It's archived on the site, it's dead now, because we had to pay for the tracking feed. And I was actually kind of worried Trevor might get arrested. But it was, um, um, you know, he was pretty technologically savvy. He's hacked all these cameras to allow him to um, photograph bases that aren't supposed to exist. You know, he comes out of Berkeley's very politically left geography department, right? And um, so, and he does also art shows around these, right? So someone like Trevor or Sharon had a different you know, kind of um, leg up on the process. But many of the scholars like Minu Malam or David Lloyd or Rebecca Imig we worked with had, you know, pretty much never used anything besides the web or email. So, which is why it's really important in that process for vectors and in how we think about designing the templates that the scholars work with the technology, right? Um, I also think it's more rewarding for our technology team than to be assigned to build things for scholars, right, who then go off and come back and critique or complain but aren't really involved in the process. I think, you know, most libraries have enormously skilled technologists working in their space in, you know, technology support groups for faculty. And, um, I think there could be both for the faculty and that staff much more intellectually rewarding collaborations um, if the, the structure is, is massaged a little bit to facilitate collaboration and communication. So, People are not allowed to be mean to my team, right? You know, because they're super smart and I don't want them um, taken for granted or, or not appreciated. I'm interested in this. Uh complementary relationship between you know what you do on vectors as a scholar and what what you were saying about the book as a kind of fossil fossilized version of the material and do you what are the implications that you've thought about in terms of the book as we move into this more you know media rich kind of environment um, I don't think the book will go away. You know, it's a really durable form. Um, it, it serves a purpose of scholarly argument in really particular ways that are much more concise and um, clean than the kind of projects I was showing you, right? Um, I mean, I think the book will, you know, probably be more like this, you know? Probably not this one, because the Kindle kind of drives me crazy, right? But, you know, I'm reading a thousand page novel right now, right? I read all my dissertations on here. My students send them to me and I put them on, right? Um, and that's, that's because even print books on this form and what I gain in portability, because I'm on planes a lot, and searchability, because my brain now works that way, that I need to be able to find the thing and not with an index, right? Um, so, I mean, I think there'll be tweaks to the form of the book that don't fundamentally change its support of scholarly argument, but that allow um, it to be interoperable in a variety of ways, right? So that not only, you know, search is the most easy and obvious, but the kind of experiments being pursued through, say, um, um, MIT with its authors right now to allow the kind of critical peer-to-peer -peer commentary of a book to live side by side with the book, I think is very interesting. You know, when you, when you network this material, what happens? So um, I think, I see the work that we do in vectors and most of the kind of things I would cl call multimodal to be good companions to print text, often using a lot of text. But, you know, I don't see the form will go away, but I think in its, and university presses will not look like they do right now in 10 years. They can't, right? You know, everybody knows that. 
Um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you mentioned that um, there needed to be a, a, a more wedded relationship between the impulse to catalog and make accessible and the one to analyze and to uh, make meaning. And I see a tension between, um, as an archivist, between archivists and librarians in which archivists have to engage with their material in a way that is more like a scholar than a cataloger, mm -hmm. and librarians who want access to be driven by um, minim minimal engagement. And uh, I'm heartened that, um, that you're moving in a direction in which the kind of collaboration and engagement will be required uh, of people in libraries. And I'm hoping that they will begin to understand that what archivists have to do is more like that kind of engagement that you're doing than the kind of engagement that catalogers do. Yeah, there's, I think, I mean, I as a scholar, you know, who benefits enormously from both librarians and archivists was literally until three or four years ago, even though much of my first book, you know, draws on archival material, clueless about the very broad, like epistemological gulf between librarians and archivists, right? Because it's just not, it, w it wasn't something I knew, right? And, and until I was at what appeared, you know, apparently I learned there as the fights broke out, right? Like a huge conference in Europe where, you know, my, my, um, my dance card now is mostly filled up being the weird scholar at the end of a library or archivist conference where they bring me out and say, here's your problem, you know, build a future for it, right? And um, at this conference, the archivists and the librarians were together, and apparently that hadn't happened in such a kind of broad space across Europe before. And, you know, it became very obvious over a course of a few days that the core impulses were quite different, right? So I was fascinated, right? We also worked at one point with um, Rick Prelinger, who um, is, uh, began with, a, with the soul of an archivist and now has uh, more, m kind of mutated or morphed into something else. But he, he started as a hoarder, somebody who, who amassed um, the world's largest collection of ephemeral films, you know, didactic, educational, kind of wacky films, which you know, he eventually gave to the Library of Congress and to some other collections. Um, but his impulse was to kind of collect and protect. And um, um, he's, he's taken this radical turn through work with Brewster Kale and other folks associated with Internet Archive. He's on the Internet Archive board now. And he has this radical manifesto that he wrote. Uh, it's, pub it's republished in a format in Vectors, um, calling for um, um, basically the opening up of the archive. And he and his wife have built a library in San Francisco that's something between a library and an art project where anybody could come in and leave anything or take anything, right? And they have work days, right? And, you know, it's a big space and it's full of stuff. And, you know, it's always full of people sort of coming in, moving around. Um, the New York Public Library has recently hired um, Josh Greenberg, who's a young PhD out of John Hopkins, who's a media historian, but whose first gig out of grad school was working at, with Dan Cohen at the Center for History and New Media, Roy Rosenweg, um, you know, real pioneers in sort of thinking about digital media. And Dan, he worked with Dan and the team on the creation of Zotero that, you know, lots of scholars use now. And he's the director of research and um, at the New York Public Library now, right? So um, it's a, it bodes a real change, I think, in sort of um, possibilities for how we think about both libraries and archives. Um, and you know, he, we're working on some K6 projects together, and I find him you know, quite visionary in thinking about you know, possible futures. So. But Rick's manifesto was great. I should have showed it today. It would have been appropriate. It's about 12 lines. But the piece also includes, he made a film out of the ephemeral footage called Panorama America that you know, exists as a kind of experimental avant-garde film in you know, a two-hour run as a linear film strip. But he broke it into component parts and put a lot of them in our project that allow people to remix the film and sort of interact with it in, in different ways. But the piece of that project's accompanied by his like manifesto for archivists. It's, 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 it's kind of Dada manifesto for archivists. But if you haven't had um, Brewster or Rick, they would be great speakers for kind of thinking about scholarly communication. 
Thank you very much. Uh, can we give Tara a round of applause? And